Appreciate everybody being here. This is uh, one of those subjects that there's a mountain of material and it's kind of hard for me to to kind of skip over some of it. Uh, but my goal is to show you what Christ faced when he started his ministry. We're getting pretty close to it. What we're looking at right now is there were three conditions, events, circumstances that were in existence or that came into existence. And they're all related to each other. Okay. And that is uh, diaspora, the dispersion, the development of the synagogues, and then the development of the Septuagint. All three of those things are interrelated, inter interlaced together. Uh, so we're kind of looking at how uh, they all exist. Last week, we finished up, pretty much finished up the diaspora. That's a dispersion. And when uh, the Roman emperor uh, Tiberius, who was uh, emperor when Jesus was uh, doing his ministry, uh, when he came into existence, or when he became emperor in uh, 14 AD, Christ was approximately 12 years old at this time. Um, and this uh, diagram shows the extent of that dispersion. And uh, basically, uh, it was in the, within the realm of the Roman Empire. And uh, that turned out to be quite providential because these were the years that, of Pax Romana. You may remember that from your history classes, uh, the Peace of Rome. Uh, so... Is a pretty good time from that aspect uh, for them. Now, were were other people aware uh, of the existence of the dispersion? Uh, the word is mentioned three times in the New Testament. Uh, one time is in First Peter one one, the introduction of First Peter. It says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, and Bithynia. And that's these regions right up in here. This is Galatia. There's Cappadocia. Bithynia is right in there. So other people were aware of the dispersion. James 1.1 1, 1 says, James a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. Greetings. So other Jews were aware that there were other Jews. In fact, there were more Jews outside of Palestine than there were inside Palestine. Estimates are about 4 million versus 2 million. But we looked at the diaspora. Okay, here we go. When um, 
when the Jews were carried off into captivity in Babylon, they had a, they are noted for their gregariousness. They like to gather together. Uh, that's a term comes from an agriculture background. That's what sheep are. They're very gregarious. They like to stick together. They, they herd together. Well, the Jews were the same way. And when they were taken to Babylon, uh, the synagogue, the development of the synagogue most likely started during the Babylon exile. Uh, and it's at that time, the more devout Jews would want to gather together. And as time went on, it became a little bit more structured. Uh, 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 after the exile, uh, the synagogues remained and even developed as a replacement uh, for the temple. The, the diaspora was scattered so far, they couldn't go to the temple. There are, were three pre, uh, festivals that male Jews were required to attend. And it would have been absolutely impossible for uh, to go every year, three times a year, for the Jews that were way off in Italy and Asia Minor and Greece and those places like that. So the synagogue began to take the place of the temple. And they were very, very significant. The three annual feasts were the Feast of Unleavened Bread or Passover. This was in early April. Uh, the Feast of Harvest or the Pentecost, which is toward the end of June. And then the Feast of Ingathering or the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles, and that was in uh, October. Now, when they first came into existence, what they, they were, it was mainly uh, reading from the Pentateuch and exposition of uh, the law. But as time went on, it would be natural to uh, add prayers, preaching, uh, would be added to the service. Thus, these meetings, which were first only on Sabbaths and feast days, became much more prominent and regular. Uh, they came to be other days. Uh, in fact, we're going to read in a minute that uh, uh, people worshipped three, six, and nine hours of each day. And that coincided with, with the temple in Jerusalem. So they tried to do that as much as possible. Uh, the essential claim uh, for the synagogue was not only prayers, but instruction in the law for all, all classes of people. A historian calls the synagogues houses of instruction where the philosophy of the fathers and all manners of virtue are taught. Uh, and Jesus used the synagogues. In Matthew 4, verse 23, it says, and he went, into, and he went throughout all of Galilee teaching in the synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. In Mark, uh, the first chapter began verse 21, it says, and they went to Capernaum and immediately on the Sabbath, 
he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And what they noticed is the way that he taught, he taught them with one who had authority, not as the scribes. What's kind of interesting is the scribes, you know, they copied the text over and over and over. And you would think that they would become very knowledgeable if they did this on a repetitive basis. But they didn't. Uh, Christ is going to accuse them of not knowing the scriptures. Now, there were many synagogues scattered through this region. Everywhere there was 10 uh, mature males and every kid considered 13 and older, there could be a synagogue. They could build a synagogue. And some cities had several synagogues. Some cities had very big synagogues. Uh, the Jewish population in Alexandria, Egypt, was uh, very, very large. And historians claim, although I believe it is a great exaggeration, but they claim that in Alexandria, they built a synagogue that had a capacity for a million worshipers. Uh, I think that's a little bit... Um, obviously a little bit exaggerated. But the synagogues were as widespread as the dispersion was. And some of these synagogues had been in existence for more than 300 years before Christ. I didn't realize that. Uh, these are the three feasts. They would become the focal point uh, of the Jewish communities. They were much more than a house of worship. They were the site of daily prayers, third, sixth, and ninth hour. They were community centers. It's where they held their weddings. Uh, they were also Jewish religious schools for all ages. And they were the site of punishment, or punishment would be administered. Now, each synagogue had a set of officials that presided over the worship uh, and the other activities of the synagogue. The first and the most important of these were the elders. And it says these officials form the local tribunals and acted as a committee of management for the Ameri affairs of the synagogue. To them belong most probably, <coughs> among other things, the power to excommunicate. In Luke chapter one, in Luke chapter seven, beginning in verse two, it says, now a centurion had a servant who was sick and at the point of death, he was highly valued by him. When the centurion, as a Roman military officer, heard about Jesus, he sent to him elders of the Jews. These were the elders of the local synagogue, asking him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they pleaded with him earnestly saying, he is worthy to have you do this for him, for he loves our neighbor, and he is the one who built us our synagogue. So they wanted Christ, to, the elders wanted Christ to help this guy out. In Ezra, uh, the 10th chapter, uh, this is right after they had come back from, or some of them had come back from Babylon, and they weren't worshiping as they should. So in uh, Ezra 10, beginning verse 7, 
And a proclamation was made throughout Judah and Jerusalem to all the returned exiles that they should assemble at Jerusalem. And if anyone did not come within three days, by orders of the officials and the elders, that's the elders of the synagogue, all his property would be forfeited and he himself banned from the congregation of the exile. Yes. No, I, I was just curious. Uh, you don't really hear throughout the scriptures other than the reference to Jesus about the, the actual temple of Jerusalem. He said, you know, I'll tear down this temple and rebuild it in three days. But throughout the rest, of, you know, from this point on, from the diaspora on, there's no reference to the importance of the temple in Jerusalem. And you don't even hear about pilgrimages back to that. Is that, do you have any well, information on that? Here's your account. Is, this is very early on. They're still reestablishing themselves coming back from the exile. Okay, and they're expanding their resettling the country. See, it's been uh, three generations since they had been taken captive to Babylon. And so these were people. But anyway, I was going to ask the question, what if our elders said, if you don't come to church on a regular basis, you're excommunicated? Think about it. in Luke chapter. Let's see where am I at? In uh, okay, let me go. In addition to the elders, and there was always a plurality of elders. Uh, there was a ruler, and each synagogue may have several rulers. In uh, uh, Mark chapter 25, uh, verse 22, it said, Then one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet. It's just kind of interesting because uh, the Pharisees at this time had said that anyone in the congregation that acknowledged that Christ was the Messiah was going to be put out of the synagogue. And here this is a ruler that he wanted to, Christ to do something for him. Uh, he had a little girl that was very sick. Uh, to be put out of the synagogue was to be deprived of the privilege of worship, to be excluded from the fellowship of the congregation, and to be regarded as a heathen. So it was, uh, it was very important uh, uh, attendance. Uh, it was, going back to the ruler, uh, they were pr most probably chosen by the um, elders, probably may have been an elder themselves, it was the ruler's responsibility to control the synagogue service. As for instance, decide who was to be called upon to read from the law and the prophets and to preach. In Acts 13, uh, verse 15, we have an account, Luke tells us about an account where Paul and his Brethren had gone into a synagogue, and it says, after reading from the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them saying, brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. And Paul did. So that was a function of the ruler. They also had a group. Uh, that were, they were called servants. He had the responsibility to see to the lighting of the synagogue 
And this was making sure there was enough oil in the lamps. That was a big thing. Uh, he was also uh, welded to scourge when punishment had to be meted out to anyone in the synagogue. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 17, it says, Christ is speaking to the apostles and said, Beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils, and they will scourge you in the synagogues. And the synagogue was an ordinary place where the Jewish courts of justice carried out or administered their punishment. Uh, Mark 13, 9 says, uh, but be on your guard for they will deliver you over to the councils and you will be beaten in the synagogues and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before me. Um, in addition to the servants, there was also an interpreter it was his duty to translate into Aramaic the passages of the law and the prophets which were read in Hebrew. In the Greek-speaking synagogues, which there are now quite a few of them, it was his duty to translate the Hebrew into Koine Greek. This was also probably not a permanent office, was billed, was filled as meeting as there was a need. There were some other servants uh, on a temporary basis, and the, the elders and the rulers would decide if they were necessary. And one of them was a group of people called almoners. And what they did is they collected and distributed to the poor and the needy in their community. Uh, so there was a very hierarchical type of arrangement in the synagogues. Uh, very quickly, services were held three times a day. Uh, this is a depiction of uh, Christ being handed to Isaiah's scroll. Uh, when he came back to Nazareth, his own town. And what you, I want you to notice about this, this is a, very typical of the arrangement of the synagogue. Uh, the menorah or the candlesticks, this one shows a seven candlestick menorah, which symbolize, symbolizes the six days of creation and the uh, Seventh day of rest. Uh, so there was all kinds of references to the creation and things such as that. Now, after the temple was rededicated, after it had been defiled by the Assyrians and uh, the Asmonians rededicated it, uh, when they went in to rededicate it, the lighting was all candles and they had to add oil to it to every, every day. And in the temple, it was a sacred type of oil. The priests had to prepare it. Well, when they started working, they found out they only had enough for one day. So they used it, but it burned for eight days till they finished the rededication of the temple. So if you see a menorah today, it may have nine candlesticks on it, which represent the eight days and the one that lit it. All right. Notice also that uh, separation of the uh, males and females uh, on one side, the cabinet in the middle is called the Ark of the Holies, and it contained all of the scrolls that the synagogue had. Uh, 
Notice the older gentleman in the top upper right. That's one of the elders. He had a, a seat up front, a chief seat. Notice that uh, this depicts several men that are wearing phylacteries on their heads. Uh, this young man that's in the front, in the middle, Notice the little uh, hair lid or locket. He was probably uh, uh, Hasidic. Uh, these were the very, very Orthodox Jews in that day and time. Let's see if there's anything I'm missing. Okay, that's a basic structure and the setup of the synagogue. The main thing you need to remember is that they tried to pattern it as much as possible after the activities uh, of the temple in Jerusalem. Of course, they couldn't because they weren't there. But for example, they had their worship services at the same time as in the temple, three, six, and nine. Or three six three six and yeah three six and nine nine o'clock in the morning noon and three o'clock in the afternoon. Now, the worship service itself was also fairly structured. Uh, they began with the shama. Uh, we'll look at that in more detail. Then they had prayers, and these prayers. This is kind of an umbrella term because uh, a lot of them were chants that came from the temple. There were psalms, there were hymns, and that would be included in the prayers. Then they would have a lesson from the law, the Pentateuch, and they had a specific point, part they were in. Uh, if a competent person was present, he would give an exposition of the Scripture passages read, and then the benediction, and they would all go home. Now, you probably read uh, some of the Shama, and you're probably very familiar, uh, but at least 10 people had to be present for a regular worship service. There were special services on Sunday and then feast days on the Sabbath, I'm sorry, on Saturdays. In order to keep the synagogue services uniform with those in the temple, both were held at the same hours, okay? The order of service was as follows. The recitation of the Shama, a confession of God's unity consisting of these three passages. I'm not going to read all three of them, but the first one that's mentioned, you'll be very familiar with. Deuteronomy 6, again, verse 4. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord our God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach him diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand. And you're going to see some pictures with straps of leather wrapped around one arm. And it would have... Uh, part of a verse from the Old Testament on it. Uh, you shall bind them on your hand. You sh they shall be in frontlets uh, between your eyes. These are the phylacteries. And you shall write them on the doorposts of your house. And I'm not going to read the rest of them, but they say basically the same thing. So uh, remember Christ was asked the question, What's the greatest commandment of all? This is what he quoted. 
This is what he quoted. After prayer, uh, there was reading of the law and the prophets. Now, after prayer, the pericope, I had to look that up to see how to pronounce it, uh, which is Hebrew for sections. Um, the, uh, that, that section for that day was from the law was read for the Sabbath. The whole Pentateuch was divided into uh, 154, 156 I have 156 on the screen, which is right. I have 154 on my notes. And what it amounted to was in the course of three years, the entire Pentateuch was read that much. And after reading the law, came the pericope from the prophets for the Sabbath. So they were very structured and very organized. And kind of had a set way to go. Um, after the reading of the Pentateuch and the prophets and some prayers, uh, uh, that was followed by a sermon, which was originally an exposition or a, an application of the law but in which the progress of time ascend a more devotional characteristic, encouragement. Anyone in the congregation might be asked by the ruler to preach or might ask the ruler for permission to preach. We have an example of this. I read a bit of it a while ago, but in Acts 13, begin verse 13, now, Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John left them and returned to Jerusalem. But they went on from Perga and came to Antioch in Presidia. And, and on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and sat down. After the reading from the Law of the Prophets, the rulers of the synagogue, Send a message to them saying, Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. So Paul stood up, motioned with his hand, Men of Israel, and you who fear God, listen. And he preached a sermon on Jesus Christ. After the sermon, there were usually more prayers or hymns. But they closed it with a benediction. Uh, and after that was pronounced, everybody said, Amen. And they went home. The spread of Christianity after the death of Christ was facilitated in a very real sense by the synagogues because they served as starting points for missionaries such as Paul. Um, I read that. Okay. You notice, if you look at the history of the church in the first century, New Testament church, the worship service was fairly similar, and similar in a lot of ways. Now, they had some extra things with it, uh, one of which would be the Lord's Supper. But, so, we had the diaspora scattered all over the Mediterranean world. And there were synagogues in each place. But through the years, they were losing how to read, to speak, or write Hebrew. They were losing that. And if they were losing that, okay, if they were losing that, they'd be losing the law. 
So after Alexander the Great, the diaspora began to expand for many reasons. Sometimes it was groups that were exiled. Sometimes there were groups that immigrated. Jewish people were very industrious, enterprising. They were traders, they were merchants. And so they moved to these other cities and they would set up colonies. And as time went by, they forgot how to read Hebrew. And most of them were in a culture where Greek was the main language. So many of the cultures, cult, country's population spoke and read Greek, especially Koine Greek. As the Jews became assimilated in their resident cultures, they forgot how to read or write or speak Hebrew. There are very two, there are two very different versions of how this problem was addressed. One of them is quite legendary. And you'll see that as we go along. And one of them was more realistic. Um, I want to look at the legendary one first, the origin of the Septuagint. According to tradition, um, Septuagint version is first mentioned in a letter of Arisus, Arisius to his brother Philocratus. Arisius was supposedly a court servant for Ptolemy. Um, Ptolemy. Ptolemy. I keep wanting to put that P on there. Here in substance is what tradition depicts as the origin of the version. Ptolemy II, Philadelphus, is a great grandson, he's a grandson of Ptolemy I. He was king of Egypt, or the Pharaoh from 287 to 74 BC. And he was, his home base, his capital city was Alexandria. Uh, and he had established a, a very valuable, large library. His goal was to have all of the major books of all of the cultures in the world at that time. Uh, he had them coming from Africa, from India, etc., places like that. But his librarian, Demetrius, uh, told him to enrich it with a copy of the sacred book of Jews. Now, as I read this, I want you to think, does this sound real? To win good graces of his people, Ptolemy, Ptolemy emancipated 100,000 slaves in different parts of his kingdom. He then sent delegates to Jerusalem uh, to ask the Jewish high priest to provide him with a copy of the law and Jews capable of translating it. Okay. Well, the delegation was very successful. A very richly ornamented copy of the law was sent to him and 72 Israelites six from each tribe. And these folks were charged to go to Egypt and carry out the wish of the king. They went to Egypt, they went to Alexandria. They were received with great honor. And during seven days, astonished everyone by the wisdom they displayed in answering 72 questions, which they were asked. Okay, so they were wined and dined for seven days. After that time, they were led into a solitary, solitary island 
of Pharos. This is the island that the lighthouse of Alexandria had been built. And it was probably in existence when they were there. Uh, anyway, on this island, they began to work translating the law, helping one another and comparing translations in proportion as they finished. After 72 days, their work was completed. The translation would have read in the presence of the king, Jewish priests, princes, people assembled at Alexander, who all recognized and praised its perfect conformity with Jewish original. And not only that, all that they had done was exactly the same. They, they were tasked to translate the Pentateuch. And so each group, it may have been singular or in pairs. When they got through, they compared them and they were all exactly the same. Uh, okay. The king was greatly pleased with the work and thus had it placed in the library. He also commissioned a couple more copies. He wanted to send them to some people. Well, the despite its legendary character, I mean, 72 interpreters in 72 days after seven days of feasting, and it was all perfect. Well, the de delegation, or uh, whoops, I'm on the wrong page. Despite its legendary character, that letter of Arisius account grant gained a great deal of credence. Uh, Aristobulus, in a passage provided uh, by Eusebius, these are names we don't need to worry about. Through the efforts of Demetrius, a complete translation of the Jewish legislation was executed in the days of Ptolemy. Arista's story is repeated almost verbatim by Jude Josephus and substantially by Phileo, another well-known Jewish historian of Alexandria. The letter and the story were accepted as genuine by many fathers and ecclesiastical writers, that's religious writers, till the beginning of the 16th century AD. And then some level-headed men started questioning some things. But the story, the letter was embellished as time went along. Uh, other details serving to um, emphasize the extraordinary origin of the version were added to Arisius's count. The 72 interpreters were inspired by God. In translating, they did not consult with one another. They had even been shut up in separate cells, either singly or in, pale, in pairs. Their translations were compared when, when compared, were found to agree entirely both the sense and expression employed from the original text. Finally, the 72 translators uh, interpreted not only the five books of the Pentateuch, but the entire Hebrew Old Testament in 72 days. Well, the authenticity of this letter is now universally denied. Uh, it's a fabrication. Uh, why? Maybe to add some credence to the Septuagint, but they didn't need it. It had a better one, a much better one. 
Um, now, let's talk a little bit about the origin that's a commonly accepted view. As to the Pentateuch, the following view seems much more plausible and is now commonly accepted in its broad lines. The Jews in the last two centuries BC were so numerous in Egypt, especially in Alexander, that at certain times they made up 40% of the entire population. Little by little, most of them ceased to use or even forget the Hebrew language in great part. And there was a danger. If they didn't know how to read the Hebrew, they wouldn't know how to read the law. Consequently, it became customary to interpret in Greek the law. Remember, we mentioned that an official in the uh, synagogues in their worship service, one of them might be an interpreter. Uh, after some time, men zealous for the law would have undertaken to compile a Greek translation of the Pentateuch. This happened about the middle of the third century BC, somewhere around 270 BC. We start, history shows us that these start showing up. As to the other Hebrew, uh, as to the other Hebrew books, the prophetical and the historical, it was natural that the Alexandrian dreams would make use of the translated Pentateuch in their synagogue service should desire to read the remaining books also, and should gradually have translated all of them to Greek, which had become their maternal language, their second language. They would be so much more likely as their knowledge of Hebrew was diminishing daily. It is not possible to determine accurately the price, precise time or the occasions on which these different translations were made. But it is certain that the law and prophets in at least part of the other books exhibited in uh, a form that they could use uh, before the year 130 BC. So 130 years before the birth of Christ, the Septuagint was widely accepted. The data being so scanty, judging by the Egyptian words and expressions, um, most of the books must have been translated in Egypt and most likely in Alexandria. What, who were the translators and how many? That's really a question that comes up. We're left with the title to the book, the Septuagint which means the 70. Uh, it seems possible, impossible to decide definitely uh, the details, uh, but examination of the text by numerous Old Testament biblical scholars show in general that the authors were not necessarily Palestinian Jews called Egypt, a difference in terminology, uh, method, etc., proved clearly that the translators were not for the same book. So we're not from the same group. It's impossible to decide or to learn if it was carried out efficiently, officially, commissioned by the king, or was merely a private undertaking that was eventually gathered together, or both of these. I think it might have been um, both of them, more the last one than the first one. But the different books were translated, were, that were translated soon came together and received as official by the Greek speaking Jews. By the time of Christ, 
30 AD and later, the Septuagint was in wide use in the Middle Eastern countries. Christ and his New Testament writers more often quoted from the Septuagint than from an original Hebrew text. Now, what does this mean when Christ used it? Do you think he would use a translation that was unreliable? No. The fact that Jesus used and quoted from the Septuagint made it most credible and reliable. It was not rejected by Jewish religion till the second century AD. <coughs> and the uh, big reason is because it was in such wide use in the New Testament church. Well, there's a Septuagint. Christ was faithful in his attendance to synagogue worship. He recognized the, dis the diaspora when given the Great Commission when he said, make disciples of all nations. So what we see is that these Jewish people were scattered all over the world for whatever reason. And being away from the temple, they needed something else in the place of the temple. So the synagogues developed and they were in widespread use. And then as they were spread out, as time went on, they forgot how to speak and use Hebrew. So the Septuagint was developed. Okay. Now, before we go to the next section, uh, I need to look at something with you guys. One of the biggest points of contention between the Pharisees and the Sadducees was the use of the oral law. Um, on Mount Sinai, God gave Moses the Torah, or the Pentateuch, which Moses wrote down. But the Jews believed that, that from that time on, there was also an oral tradition which was never written down, but was used to interpret the Torah. This was primarily passed down by scribes and sages. Whoops. The second okay. bell rang. Well, this is a good place to start next week. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? 